Hello, friends, and welcome to our broadcast. My name is Larry Hutton. This is Limitless Life. Hey, p- friends and partners, got to share something with you today. Before I came on the air, I was stirring up joy. Do you know how to stir up joy? Remember Nehemiah 8:10? It says, "The joy of the Lord is our strength." Well, how many of you watching want to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might? Come on, think about that. I'm going to be strong in the Lord. So I'm not strong in myself. I'm actually strong in the Lord, which is where I'm at. If you're born again, if you've accepted Jesus, you are in Christ, right? You are in the Lord. So you're supposed to be strong in the Lord. Of course, you're going to be strong if you're acting like you're in the Lord because it's his strength, right? So it says strong that that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Hmm. So the joy of the Lord is what will cause me to be strong in the, while I'm in the Lord, right? The joy of the Lord. Ha ha, because I'm in Him. I've got His strength and I've got His joy. So what do you do? you got to stir up the joy. So before I came on the air, I was just speaking the Word and worshiping God and thanking God for His truth that sets me free. And I started laughing and I just, I, mean, I stirred up joy. <laughs> I want to do it right now. I can't help it. It's just like, oh Lord. What, now, now what happens when we do that? It doesn't mean we feel like it. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're just feeling wonderful today. There's days that my physical body, it may not feel good, but all I do is stir up joy. And then what am I? Well, then I stir up joy and the joy of the Lord strengthens me and I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And then I go right through the valley of the shadow of death, right through that test or trial, right through when your body's not feeling good. And all of a sudden your body changes and it feels good. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. So stir up joy, man, stir it up. If you have to make yourself laugh, well, brother, I don't want to fake it. You're not faking it. If you're doing it according to your word, you're faithing it. Don't fake it, faith it. Do you hear the difference? Not F-A-K-E, don't fake, but F-A-I-T-H, faith it. That's how you release grace. By grace are you saved, healed, delivered, set free, everything through faith. Man, that's good preaching and I haven't even got to my message, but it all goes along with what we've been talking about now for the last seven and a half months when we started this series over seven and a half months ago. This today, uh, we're in our, we're finishing today and tomorrow will be the end of our 31st week of this series that we're doing. Today is my 154th lesson, but the cool thing about this series is we cover so many different subjects, so it's not like you're doing one subject for seven months long. Some people might think that would be boring, but if you've been with us all through this, we're we're covering so many different subjects. It is so helpful, so enlightening, so relevant for today that you can take each one of these messages and say, okay, I can walk that out. I can live that today. I can live that this week. I can definitely do that this month. It's, it's so, it's so revealing. So it's a three part series, part A, part B, and part C. Part A And I call this the ABCs of true Christianity, because if somebody gets a hold of these ABCs, they will literally just go right through the DEFs all the way to the XYZs. Wow. So part A of the series is what God has made you. In other words, who are you in Christ Jesus? Part B is what God has given you. That is, what do you have because you are in Christ Jesus? And then part C is what you can do. What has God enabled you to do because you're in Christ Jesus? The first six weeks we covered part A, 23 things that God has made you. The last 24 weeks we've been covering part B, 23 things that God has given you. The foundation text has been 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, and this is the part we've zeroed in on this 1 1 John 4, 17. As he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is now, so are we now in this world. And 1 John 2, 6, we can walk even as he walked. Why? Because we abide in him. We are in Christ, so we're to walk even as he walked. And then, of course, Colossians 2, 6, the way we received him is the way we walk. How do you walk the way you received? How did you receive? By grace through faith. So how do you walk? By grace through faith. Okay, so part A is what God has already made you. I'm going to reiterate that because I do that every Monday and every Thursday week of the week so that you are put into remembrance. What God has already made you. Number one, he's made you an eternal being. You are a spirit. 
but that means you're an eternal being is what that means. It doesn't mean you're some, something that can't be seen and you float around. And No, a spirit being, you're an, you're an eternal being created like God. In fact, God created you in His image and likeness. He created you in His class of being. You exist as a God in God's class. God actually puts you right below Him where he is the king of kings, lord of lords, but he actually made you in a God class of being above Satan, above angels, even the good angels of heaven, Michael and Gabriel, the archangels are below you in a lower class of being than you. And, and each one of these things, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of verses proving these things. So it's just so powerful when you get to know this truth and it makes you free. So you, number one, you are an eternal being. Number two, you are God's very own son or his very own daughter. Number three, God has made you his servant. Number four, God has made you his friend. I'm going to back up because I could just hear somebody that maybe joined us. Wait a minute. You said I'm a son. Then you said I'm a servant. But Paul said in Galatians 4 that I'm no longer a servant, but a son. Well, we found out in the passages, and then Paul later on called himself a servant of Jesus Christ. So even though he said, I'm no longer a servant but a son, then later on he calls himself a servant of Jesus. So yes, we are servants of God, I mean, sons of God, daughters of God positionally, but our purpose is to serve Jesus to the world. We are a servant of Jesus Christ. Number four, God has made you his friend. You're a very dear friend. Number five, God has made you an heir of Jesus, an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. Number six, God has made you righteous with his righteousness. That means you have the ability to stand before the presence of God Almighty without any sense of guilt, without any sense of shame, as though sin never existed in your life. That's what it means when he gave you his righteousness. Number seven, God has made you a chosen one. He made you a chosen one. He handpicked, hand selected you. Praise God. Number eight, God has made you his representative. You're an ambassador of his government. Number nine, God has made you an anointed one like he did Jesus. Number 10, God made you a love being. Number uh, 11, God made you the redeemed. Number 12, God made you royalty. Number 13, God made you holy. Number 14, God made you his purchased and protected possession. I love that. You're purchased and protected by him. You're, you're special to God. You are his prized possession. Number 15, God has made you his temple. Number 16, God has made you the light of the world. Number 17, God has made you the salt of the earth. Number 18, God has made you an overcomer. Number 19, God has made you more than a conqueror. Number 20, God has made you well or whole in your physical body. Number 21, God has made you financially independent of the world system. Number 22, God has made you a soldier in his army. And number 23, God has made you complete in him. That's part A of our series series that we covered the first six weeks of this teaching. The last, uh, all these other weeks now for these seven, over seven and a half months, we've covered part B. Uh, number one, God has given you Jesus. He's given you himself. Number two, God has given you the same anointing that he gave Jesus. Number three, God has given you his Zoe. His very life is inside you. Number four, God has given you a team, a permanent position on that team, and he even put himself on your team. Number five, God has given you his love. Number six, God has given you the Holy Spirit. Number seven, God has given you his weapons and his armor. Whew. This is not of human origin, folks. This is powerful weapons and armor. Number, 18, God, number, or number eight, God has already given you everything you need to live a fun, happy, fulfilled life. You can live the dream, my friend. And we covered a lot of scriptures proving that. Number nine, God has given you all of heaven's authority and all the power to back it up. Number 10, God has given you nine attributes of his character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, which includes faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God's given you these nine attributes of himself and he's put them in you for you to use, given them to you. Wow. Number, number 11, God's given you the name. Number 12, God's given you the word. Number 13, God's given you the blood. Man, I think about those three things all the time. I have the name, I have the word, and I have the blood. Whoo! I can overcome anything in life that tries to overcome me, even with just those three things, just knowledge of those three things. Wow. Number 14, God has given you full access 
access. Of course, this is by the blood that you have access, but he's given you full access to the throne of God, full access to the throne of grace. Or you could say it this way. God has given you access to him, to his presence anytime you need it, no matter where you're at and no matter what you're going through for anything. That's powerful. Number 15, God has given you total freedom and total liberty to live your life. Number 16, God has given you angels that are assigned to help you. Number 17, God has given you a pathway to brighter tomorrows and a wonderful future. Number 18, God has already given you citizenship in heaven. Your name's already there, preceded you, personally handwritten by God. Number 19, God has given you His righteousness. Number 20, God has given you His health for your physical body. Number 21, God has given you His financial blessings and the ability to acquire them. I just get so blessed reading these things to you, I'm telling you, reminding you of what God's given you, what He's, what he's made you and what God's given you. Number 22, God has given you men and women ministers like myself, men and women ministers as gifts to you to help equip you. He's given you apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all of those gifts given to equip you so that you can work in the ministry. I'm not talking about the fivefold. I'm just talking about work as, as a minister of reconciliation. Every one of us are called to that. Every single human being that gets born again, you're a minister. And God's given men and women ministers like myself as gifts to you to help equip you in life. So you can't be fully equipped. And that's why those of you that watch me continually, you're wanting to be equipped. Those of you that have a good pastor and you go to that church and you get equipped by him, that's why you do it. Because you know you need equipped by these gifts. And then number 23, the 23rd thing that we've been talking about, I, I didn't plan this, by the way. When I started, I didn't have 23 things uh, God's made you and 23 things that God's given you. I didn't do that. It just came out this way. I, don't, I guess by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I, I teach by the grace of God. Uh, like I said, it's not exhaustive anyway. So when we did the 23 things that God's made you, we saw we could have divided them up like, you know, even the 23 things that God's given you. When I said he gave you the nine fruit of the spirit, we could have made those nine things instead of one thing. So in other words, it's not an exhaustive list here. I'm sure there's more things God's made you and given you that maybe we don't cover, but it's a pretty, pretty uh, complete list here. Fairly complete list. Um, so the 23rd thing that God has given you is he's given you a purpose for living. I love that. What is your purpose? So many people wondering, what am I here for? What is life all about? And what we found out the number one purpose is, the number one calling on your life is to be a companion of God. Well, what, what do you mean? A friend, a, a comrade, a confidant, a partner, a, a bosom buddy with your creator. And we found that out. We went through scriptures and found out just like Adam, the reason God made you. Here's your number one calling in life and number one purpose. Adam and Eve every day would walk with God as a friend, as a comrade, as a partner, as a bosom buddy. It wasn't just them having fellowship with God, but God having fellowship with them your number one purpose. And, and when, you, uh, when you walk in that calling and you realize, okay, my number one purpose in life, and this is an eternal purpose because you're going to do it for eternity. So why not start doing it now instead of wait till you get to heaven, right? So here's your eternal purpose. When you grab this eternal purpose, all of the other things that you're called to in life and that you do in life, that people, oh man, what am I called to do? What am I here for? Get a hold of your eternal purpose. It will fulfill your other purposes and your other callings. So we ended, of course, then we started discussing, of course, the eternal purpose is, is the whole big, the big picture. But then we started looking at the little picture of some things you might be called to while you're a human being here on the earth. And we were in Romans 12. So let's go back there where it actually talks more about specific purposes in your life. Romans 12, 6, and this is written to every Christian. This isn't, isn't written to preachers, but it includes preachers, as you can see when we read it. But 
Verse 6, Romans 12, 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let us minister. And in, in, if it's in teaching, then in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we look, there's seven different Uh, gifts or graces of God, callings upon people's lives mentioned here. It's not an exhaustive list that Paul does here, but he gives people an understanding that you may be called. And when you look at all these, probably, probably everybody is called to one of these things, right? So uh, the gift of prophecy, maybe everybody's not called to that one. Uh, ministry. You may not be called to ministry as far as a five-fold ministry, but you are called to the ministry of reconciliation. You are called to a ministry where you uh, represent God's government, right? We found that out. So, so it applies to you in some form. Um, teaching. Maybe you're not called as a teacher to the body of Christ like I am, but you are called to in teaching you, whether it's teaching children or helping other people learn about Jesus and about the ways and thoughts of God. You're called in teaching. So draw on that grace. How about exhortation? Maybe you're called as an exhorter. How about a giver? Maybe you're called to make a lot of money and that's okay. Don't feel bad about, gosh, man, I just want to, I just have a desire to make a lot of money. It's not bad. Use the grace to to empower those of us that I can't go work a secular job like a business and do what you're doing. So use your money to to empower us, to bless our ministries, though your pastor and myself and other ministries that impart to you. Use your use your gifts to support them. Uh, He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy. We actually talked about all of these seven gifts in detail. And when I closed last program, I told you I had a twofold purpose in bringing you to these verses in Romans 12. Remember, first was to show you some of the graces that you might be called to, but the other was to show you that you actually have to do something in order for your callings to come to pass or come to come forth in your life. Let me show you what I mean. These verses that we're looking at here in verses six through eight do reveal different callings or graces that you may be called to, but verses one through three actually show you how to find out what they are. Let's let's read them. Verse one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, your reasonable service, which is, as italicized, so it's really not there, which is your reasonable service or your reasonable service. And verse two, do not be conformed to this world. That shows you the world has a way of trying to conform you, doesn't it? To its thoughts, to its ways, to its patterns, right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, and then remember we get down to verse 6 and 7 and 8. We start seeing graces that are given to us or you or me. Or, and, and it's grace meaning it has nothing to do with my ability but all to do with God's ability, right? I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think more highly than he ought to think. That The words of himself are italicized. They were... Um, Well, actually, I'm reading the New King James here, so I wasn't even looking at the King James. But anyway, uh, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Uh, If you've been with me when we studied that out on previous teachings, you are to think highly. Jesus thought highly of himself, and yet he humbled himself to the will of God. We are to think highly about who you are in Christ, but not more highly than you ought to think. In other words, he's saying you don't think you're better than someone else. You think of yourself highly. They're supposed to think of themselves highly. But if they don't, you don't think you're better than them. You just pull them up to your level of Jesus. Amen. So you don't think of yourself more highly, uh, but to think soberly as or according to. So here's how you think according God has dealt to you the measure of faith. 
Well, listen, if you're operating in faith, you're going to be thinking highly. You're going to be thinking, I can overcome. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm victorious. I can win. God's made me the head, not the tail above, not beneath, going over, not going. When I go through the fire, I'll not be burned. When I go through the waters, you're thinking of yourself highly. But it's according to God's faith that he dealt to you, see. So then verses 4 and 5 tell us that we're all different and yet still part of one body. And then verses 6 through 8 that we've already looked at show us the different graces or callings of God that we can operate in. So let's look at this closer. And we're going to have to take this program and next program, but that's okay. So verse 1 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which, are, which you, you, are, you are to use and worship your God. Verse 2 says, don't allow the world to conform you to its will, but allow God to renew your mind so that you become living proof of the good, acceptable, perfect will. So that's what it's saying. Let's look closely. Verse 1, the first question that some have is this. Present yourself as a living sacrifice. Okay, Lord, how do I present my body as a living sacrifice? All right, look at it. It says to present your body. First of all, the word present here means, uh, in the Greek, it means to stand beside. Uh, it means to, to place yourself at God's disposal. Um, it means to be ready and be willing to promote him, to exhibit him, to prove him. Then the word body, so think about present yourselves to stand beside, place yourself at God's disposal, be ready and willing to promote him, to exhibit him, to prove him. So that's what present means. And then the word body here is referring to your physical body, but, no, but you know you are not just a one part being. Remember 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, uh, you are a three part being, spirit, soul, and body. So you, this says, you present your body. You, so since you are presenting your body, then it means you and your soul and your body, you are representing it then since you're presenting your body, then you are presenting yourself, all right? But it does include the body in which you and I are to present. Then it tells us there are three things that we are to do in presenting our bodies. Number one, it tells us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Hmm. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Number two, it says... Uh, present your bodies as holy. Okay. Number three, present your bodies to be accepted or acceptable. And then it says all of that is your reasonable service. So we're going to get in detail about all of that. But present your body uh, a living sacrifice. So a living sacrifice. The word living here is actually a verb. Uh, it denotes not just breathing, but one who enjoys life. Um, this word living means somebody that's active, somebody that's blessed. It's somebody that I'm fresh and I'm strong and I'm efficient at what I do. That's what the word living sacrifice means. So I've got to present my body uh, as someone who enjoys life. Someone who is active and blessed with God and I'm fresh and strong in Jesus and I'm efficient in Jesus, right? It said living sacrifice. Then the word sacrifice is actually the same, same Greek word that's used throughout the New Testament when, when it talks about Jesus was a sacrifice. He laid down his, his self as a sacrifice for our sins. And the word sacrifice means where you surrender yourself or you give yourself up for the sake of another. That's what surrender means or sacrifice means. So it means you're laying your life down to follow God's plans and follow God's purposes. You know, it might be something you do every single week at church. Maybe you go to church and you're in the helps ministry, you're in the praise and worship. And it takes a lot of hours. I know I used to be a praise and worship leader. It takes a lot of hours. You get to get there early. A lot of times stay late. You're rehearsing. You have different days besides church days maybe. And 
you're having to make a sacrifice of your time. And so you want to present yourself a living sacrifice. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm going to present. I, I, I'm active and blessed to do this. I'm fresh and strong, but I'm an efficient one to do this. That's what's talking about being a living sacrifice. Man, I'm going to have to stop here and get into this because I want to give you some more examples of what that you might be doing to be a living sacrifice. It'll help you understand this even more next program. But all of these things, as we look at these, they're going to help you fulfill the natural graces that are upon your life. But even more, they're going to help you fill the number one calling of your life to commune, to commune. Not just for God to have you commune, but for you to commune with God, to have God commune with you. In other words, you, you do this together. You're bosom buddies. He loves your fellowship as much as you love his fellowship. That's your number one calling in life, the number one purpose in life. And if you embrace that, all the other callings and giftings will fall into line. We're out of time. We'll pick up your next program. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you partners for supporting us. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for emailing us or calling us, letting us know whether these are being a blessing to you. We'll see you next program. Have a wonderful Jesus filled day. Bye bye. Do you know yourself who you really are? Not the natural carnal person that the world says you are, but the saved word filled Holy Spirit empowered believer that you really are in the eyes of God. At times, each of us has struggled with our identity, ability, and purpose in our lives as believers. But God's Word is filled with His descriptions of who you really are in Him. In this two-part scripture recording, you will hear Dr. Hutton quote all the Bible scriptures about who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what you can do in Christ. In Him scriptures will help you build and strengthen the very foundations of your faith, enabling you to believe and therefore speak all that God has created you to be, to have, and to do, not in your own power, but in Him. To order In Him scriptures, go to larryhutton.org or call 888-887-WORD. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, Go to LarryHutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call 1-888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton, where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org or you can call 888-887-WORD.